Well, good morning, Westridge Church. We are so glad you guys are celebrating with us today. We're going to get started with worship in the music side in just a second. But first, we're going to get started with worship with some life change that's happened, some, some families right here. You guys can go ahead and come on in. Every single person you see up here, every single kid, they have already chosen to follow Jesus. They've made a decision, prayed and said, God, I surrender my life to you. And now they want to follow that decision with baptism, which is a celebration with you, their church family, and you get to hear their testimony. So super excited about these guys being a part. And mom and dad are back here with us. So I love it when everybody gets in the tub together. So this is a family. This is the Webb family. And this is Braylon right here. And just a reminder that when we make a decision to follow Jesus, that decision, us being with him, starts the second we make that decision. It's not a decision we make that, man, we can't wait. One day we're going to be to heaven. I mean, heaven with Jesus starts the second we trust in him. And I'm so excited when kids make that decision because the guardrails God can put up in their, in their lives to protect them from things, the way that he can start impacting this world at this age, that's huge. I mean, the schools, the opportunity God is going to allow them to have. And so you guys should be very proud. What an exciting time we get to do. So, sorry, right, this is Braylon. Braylon said, uh, my mom and dad had been talking to me about Jesus. One day, we went to the Christian bookstore, and I heard a story about Jesus talking to Nicodemus and explaining John chapter 3, verse 16. We talked about the show The Chosen when we were back there. Just what a great way it visualizes Nicodemus and Jesus having that competition, or that, that, uh, that, that conversation. If you haven't watched The Chosen, man, great thing to do together as a family. Um, they said, when we were about to leave, I told my parents I wanted to follow Jesus and learn more about him. In the car, we said a prayer to ask Jesus into my heart. And since accepting Jesus, I have felt better about myself and I can tell more people about Jesus. Braylon, you sure can. I am so excited you make that decision, Braylon. Great job. All right, JP, what you got over there? All right. I have Aslan. And she's a... When she was younger and getting ready for bed, she was talking to mom about heaven. And right then, she made a decision to accept Jesus Christ as her personal Lord and Savior. Since then, God has helped her to overcome personal issues, to make her a better servant of God. Specifically, during the pandemic, uh, she had gotten closer to God in her extra time at home. Now, she says, I'm ready to share God's love and affection with others. I like it. I like it. That's great, guys. All right. Because of that profession of faith, you've told us your testimony of putting your trust in Jesus. Have you both asked him into your heart to be your Lord and Savior? Yes. yes I love that. Well, because of that profession of faith, it is now our pleasure. Get your hands in here. To baptize you both in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Be buried with him in death, death. and raised Thank to walk in a brand new life. Woo! Good job, guys. Congratulations. Congrats, everybody. Some proud parents right there. I love it. You guys, come on in. I'm so excited when parents play such a key role in their kids coming to Jesus because, I mean, God has called us to no greater honor than to raise up our kids to follow him. And so, what a cool, a cool opportunity moms, dads, families, we have to show the love of Jesus to our very own kids. All right, so this is uh, Sadie Kitchens. You got, uh, everybody's shoes are off. I saw some shoes earlier, so good job. You took them off. All right, that's good. All right, this is Sadie. Sadie, mom's up here taking pictures, and she was overjoyed. I think mom and dad were both overjoyed up there. She says, I asked Jesus into my heart a few years ago. I was in my bed, and my dad was with me. I started to think about how to ask Jesus into my heart. My dad helped me with the words to say, I want to get baptized because it's the next step in my relationship with God. I love that, Sadie. Great testimony. Spread that to the world. Awesome. Next we have Kylie Duncan, and her testimony begins this way. At the beginning of the new year, I went to my mom and told her, I want to live the rest of my life believing and following Jesus. I learned about how Jesus died on the cross for my sins. That night, we prayed together at home and then talked about attending splash class so I could get baptized. I am excited to be a part 
of God's family. I love it. I love it. Great job, ladies. All right, so Pastor JP and I have a question for both of you. Have you accepted Jesus in your heart to be your personal Lord and Savior? Yes, yes. I love that. Well, because of that profession of faith in front of your church family, in front of the God of this universe, it is our honor to baptize you both in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Be buried with him in death and raised to walk a brand new life. Good job, girls. I love that. I love that. JP, what are we about to do? Ladies and gentlemen, whether you're worshiping with us in person or whether you're online, we're about to worship the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And this is what it's all about. The angels in heaven are excited about the decisions that have been made and the lives that are already being transformed. Let's worship the Lord because this is what worship is all about. It's about warfare, it's about victory, and praise be to God for the great things he has done. Come on. Yeah, church, let's stand to our feet. Let's remind ourselves that praise is our weapon. We start out today celebrating life change and celebrating the fact that when we put praise on our lips, the enemy flees. So come on, let's silence that enemy today as we sing this. Let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. And let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. So let it rise. Let your praise arise. We're going to sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. And we sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Oh, fear cannot survive. When we praise you, the God of breakthroughs on our side, forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Whoa, we praise you. Whoa, come on, let faith rise. Let faith be the song that overcomes the rain. And let faith be the song that calms the storm inside of me. Let it rise. Let faith arise. Come on, we need a little more faith. So let faith be the song that overcomes the raging sea. And let faith be the song that calms the storm inside of me. Let it rise, let your faith arise, let it rise. We'll see you break down every wall, we'll watch our giants fall. Oh, fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side, forever lift him high with all creation. Church, let's believe what we're declaring. Let's believe what's behind our praise, what's behind the song. We have this moment right here where we sing, this is what living looks like, what freedom feels like and what heaven sounds like. Don't make us liars today. I have those moments where it's like, man, I'm not giving it my all. You're holding something back. Don't hold anything back. Maybe that word for you is freedom, it's permission. Listen, if you just need to move a little bit, Miles has to do that sometimes. We have to give him space. Maybe you just need some space to say, this is what freedom looks like. Man, when we say this is what heaven sounds like, if we're not praising God loud, 
I don't think it's a good picture of heaven, but I think we can do that here today. Let's remind ourselves of that as we sing this. This is what it looks like, come on. So this is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. When we praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. When we praise you, come on, keep singing. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven we praise. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch those giants fall. Oh, fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lives in creation cry God we praise you oh, 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 oh. we praise you oh, 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 oh. we praise you God oh may it never stop we praise you oh one last time we sing we praise you we praise you Can we teach you guys a new song this morning? It goes like this. Oh, and I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. And I see your promises and fulfillment all over my life all over my life and i see the evidence of your goodness all over my life all over my life and i see your promises and fulfillment all over my life all over my All throughout my history, your faithfulness has walked beside me. The winter storms made way for spring. In every season, from where I'm standing, I see the evidence of goodness all over my life all over my life and I see your promises and fulfillment all over my life all over my life help me remember 
promises, Lord. I see your promises in fulfillment all over my in fulfillment all over my life it's all over my life all over my life Jesus all we see the evidence of God's goodness and his kindness and his faithfulness it's all around us it follows us all the days of our lives the way that he cares for us the way that he takes care of all our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus, the way he answers our prayers, the way he forgives us of all our sins, the way he's healed us. Come on, right now, let's just worship the Lord in your own words right now, either out loud or in your heart. I just want you to thank God for his goodness, for his faithfulness, that follows us. Come on, right now. Let's just worship Jesus right now. Just tell him thank you. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Your goodness and mercy that follow me all the days of my life. I see the evidence. The way you take care of me and my family. How you walk with me, Lord.
the king of love had given up his life the darkest day in history they're on the cross they made for sinners for every curse his blood atoned One final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known Then the earth began to shake And the veil was torn What sacrifice was made As the heavens rose Let's sing this together. It's time to live the world. There was a moment when the sky lit up. A flash of light breaking through. When all was lost, he crossed eternity.
make some noise in this place today. That's what I'm talking about. Let's go, church. You may be seated. Amen, amen. How about that? That's what I'm talking about. Well, today is going to be a special day at Westridge Church. We're going to be talking and dreaming together about the future that we believe God has in store for us. One of the things that you're going to hear about today is that we believe we have a burden, we have a conviction here that God is leading and calling Westridge Church to be a house of prayer. If you've been tracking with us, this is no news to you that this is a conviction of our church, it's a conviction of our pastor. And one of the opportunities that you have to step into this, maybe you're new to prayer, maybe it's still uncomfortable, maybe you're working through it. Well, we wanna give you an opportunity tomorrow night to join us here in the worship center for a church-wide prayer gathering. Whether you're an individual in our church, a family in our church, a group leader, a group member, maybe this is the first time you've ever walked through our doors. We wanna invite you to be here tomorrow night as we draw near to God, seeking his heart and seeking his face for ourselves, for our own walks with the Lord, our own, our church, our community, our families. But we want his best for today. We want his best for the future. So we wanna invite you to come be a part of that tomorrow night. And speaking of the days ahead, an exciting opportunity that we have every single summer is Rush 2022, Rush Camp this summer. Who's excited about Rush? I know you guys should be. That's what I'm talking about. So this is an opportunity every single summer that we have, and we've seen thousands of students have their lives dramatically changed by an encounter and an experience with Jesus through Rush Camp. And so registrations opened last week. They're gonna be open through March 30th, so you have plenty of time, but we wanna encourage you to jump on that. If you have a student in your home, we really wanna encourage you to get them there because this has been such an impactful week in the lives of students. But also, if you don't have a student, I wanna invite you to serve. This is such an opportunity for you to be on the front lines of seeing Jesus change the lives of students. And so if you can get off work, if you can make it, we want you to be there to be on the front lines to see Jesus change students' lives. As a group leader or serving on a team, we wanna invite you to be there. If you can't get those days off work, if you're not able to be there in person, then we wanna encourage you. You can pay the way for a student to experience Jesus. We don't want any student missing out for any reason on this week. And so if you feel God calling you, God leading you to do that, you can go, there's a QR code that, that popped up there. You can go to westridge.com slash rush and you can have all the prompts there to be a group leader, to pay the way for someone to be able to experience Jesus at Rush. There are so many beautiful things happening in our church and there's so many things still in store for the days ahead. And that's what today is all about, is we're celebrating the past, but we're, look forward, we're looking forward to the future to see what God still has in store for us. And so church, would you put your hands together? Would you welcome our founding and senior pastor, Brian Boy, as he comes and shares his heart and the vision for our church in the days ahead. Oh, it's good to be here today. Welcome to everybody uh, who is in the building. Welcome to everybody who is watching online. I know there's many, many of you who are with us online today. Today is going to be a little bit of a different morning. If you're visiting for the very first time, we're really glad you're here. Um, today is going to be a little bit different. And uh, let me just say this, okay? It's probably going to be a little longer service than, than normal. So you're like, oh, I like that. Woo, all right. That actually makes me happy. It's like, all right. Someone loves being here. So anyway, so glad that you're here. And um, I want you to get your Bible and turn to Philippians chapter 3. Um, before I jump in, this has been a fun week for my wife, Amy. She released her first book that she wrote by herself. Uh, we, we, wrote, we wrote one together a few years ago, but she wrote her first one uh, last year, and it's called Between Ball Games: Stories and Wisdom on Raising Up and Cheering Strong Young Men. And so if um, you are... Uh, you know, a, a mom of boys, a grandmother of boys, or you are a dad who is married to a mom of boys or anything like that. My wife's going to be in the atrium, and she has a lot of these books. If you go on Amazon, they're fifteen ninety nine, and she's going to be selling them for 12 and $1 of every book is going to go towards building a well in Africa, Burkina Faso, Africa. Uh, so I'm excited for her, and this book's been so great. I'm reading it through a second time, and uh, just a great resource for raising up young men in today's world. And, and so it's a great baby shower gift. And hey, guys, let me just say this. Valentine's Day's coming. I'm going to warn you, it's coming, okay? 
We don't celebrate Val- Valentine's Day is coming, okay? So um, it's a great, this is a great gift for your, for your wife uh, to, to uh, just raising kids. So anyways, today is a Vision Sunday. And I, a few weeks ago, I was laying out uh, just the next several months of teaching. And I, was, and I realized I, ha- I have not done a vision morning in a while. And I decided that today would be a good day. We just came out of the series called, uh, called Draw Near, which I absolutely loved. And we're moving into a brand new series starting next Sunday on the book of Jonah. Which Isn't that a cool graphic? Um, study the book of Jonah, four weeks in Jonah. And then we're going to be going into a series called Abide, which is going to be about John 14, 15, 16, the last actual teaching of Jesus before he uh, went to the cross. So I'm excited about that. But this morning, I'm, I'm going to be giving, I'm just going to tell you this, I'm going to be giving you a lot of information. This may be one of those mornings you have to watch this again uh, because I'm going to put a lot of stats, a lot of facts and graphs and pie charts and quotes up on the screen. But I, I want to talk about where we have been as a church over the past few years. But I also want to talk about what's been going on in the big C church in America over the last couple of years, okay? And then I want to cast some vision for us as a church go, as we go into the future. And as I do all of this, I'm just going to be really honest. I'm, I'm going to say some things this morning that may seem a bit raw. Uh, I, I want to be very honest about the state of our church inside the building and outside the building. One of, the, one of our church values is um, authenticity, and so I'm going to be real, and, I, and as I said a moment ago, I'm going to be very honest and maybe a bit raw, but my hope is that you will leave here challenged and convic- convicted and hopefully inspired. So before we jump in, I'll, let's just take a moment and pray, and then we'll, we'll dive into this. So Father, we ask, I ask this morning that you will help me as I, as I convey all of this to our church and to all of those who are watching online in a, in a way that is understandable. I, I pray that your Holy Spirit would stir us up inside to become more fully devoted followers of Jesus, that our ears and our eyes would be open and our hearts would be open to what you have for us as we take our next step, as we plan to live our lives on mission, to be sent to live for Jesus. We thank you for this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's talk a little bit about where we have been. Um, I think it goes without saying that the, the last few years have been very challenging. Nothing I learned in college or seminary or even 34 plus years of being in pastoral ministry prepared me for all of the things that we've had to navigate through since March 2020. But God has been faithful. And I say that with all my heart. All of these challenges have also come with a lot of big wins and a lot of big opportunities. And I want to talk a moment about that because I want, I want you to see how the last couple of years have impacted this church in, in a positive way. Um, so let me just say this. Let me talk about adult in-person attendance and then online engagement, okay? Our in-person attendance right now is about 63% pre-COVID. 63% of you have come back uh, to weekly attendance. And the good thing is that number continues to grow, which is very encouraging to me. But here's how our people are engaging this particular service every single week. 54% of our adults are engaging with our Sunday gathering online. 46% of our adults are engaging with our Sunday gathering in person. The number of people watching online each week is now four times what it was pre-COVID. So we are averaging more than 4,000 views per week of this service. Okay, now that... Now, let me tell you how we track that. We, we look at YouTube and Facebook and all of the different venues that people can watch this. And some of you at home are watching online at the moment. But we, if, if, if somebody watches less than 20 minutes, we don't count that. So if somebody has to watch 20 minutes or more for us to count that they were present in this service online. So 40, 000, uh, excuse me, 4,000 ver- views per moment. Now, let me show you a couple slides that I think will give you a breakdown. Which This is kind of cool of where people are watching from, from online. This is... Our national viewership for this particular service, this is the people who watch all over the United States, and then you can see like Puerto Rico and down into Mexico and different places like that. That's where people are watching from every week, okay? Now, this is cool. This is Georgia. Our biggest viewership is in Ackworth, and then second is Atlanta. Now, some of you may go, explain that. I don't have an explanation for it. 
Okay, and then Dallas, Hiram, Marietta, Powder Springs. That's where people are watching from. So all of you downtown Atlanta, we're so glad you're with us today, all right? Um, the number of people that call Westridge their, their home church right now is over 15,000 people. That doesn't mean you're here every Sunday or even watching, but that's who, we know that from several things over the last couple of years, calling people, viewing people who have been here, attending, you know, all the, all the things. Very hard for us to track who's actually watching online. But we, we're, we know that there are about 15,000 people that call this their home. That means that if somebody has a problem, someone wants to get married, somebody's died, they're calling us. So you, you can see the, 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 the reach that we're having right now. Now, I want to just share something with you that is really inspiring and cool. I want to talk for a moment about children's ministry online engagement. Since April 2020, our Westridge Kids Ministry YouTube channel, which is led by Brent Moxie and his band of crazies, um, they have just reached over a million views in the last couple of years. <clears throat> they are averaging, they're averaging 19 to 23,000 views per week. Now, I want to show you where people are watching from. For whatever reason, people in Texas love our kids' ministry. <laughs> All right, and then you can see Georgia, California, North Carolina, Florida. Now, this will blow your mind. You ready for this one? This is where people are watching from all over the world. Brent Moxie is a rock star in Moscow. Okay? And, and for those of you who know things about Europe, I mean, it's fascinating to me. It really is. I mean, we have less viewership in the United States, and we do it in a country like France that's very, in many ways, closed off from the gospel. So I'm just so encouraged by that. Our kids' ministry has done an incredible job of not only keeping our own kids engaged in church, but literally reaching kids all over the world right now, which is so fascinating. Let me give you a couple other wins to celebrate. Our giving right now is up 5% year-to-date from where it was in 2021. Each week, people are serving on a team that's up 5% from January, January 2021. 89% of our adult attendees are currently in a group. My goal has always been 80%, and we're currently beyond that. Uh, in 2021, we gave away over 100,000 in benevolence. 2020, we gave over 150,000 uh, in benevolence. That included a, a, a home that we rebuilt for a, a mom with two daughters with special needs. Our hope for Christmas uh, that just, we just had in December we, had over we were able to serve over 1,300 families. And our Christmas gift offering, our goal was 325,000. We're, we're currently at 336,000. So right now, right now our giving, and, and this is even with all the stuff I shared with you about like attendance, and this, our giving right now is better than it's ever been in the history of this church, which again, I, it's hard for me to explain that outside of God's faithfulness. I can't, I can't put my finger on it outside of the, the fact that people have just been faithful. Now, I, I want to shift gears for a moment. I want to talk about the current state of the big C church outside, the, the church in America, and how, how some of, of, of all of what's been going on over the last couple of years has impacted even our own church, okay? These are challenging, very challenging stats. Church attendance has dropped 12% in the U.S. over the past 18 months, and I'm going to show you each, with each one of these where I got this information. 29% of U.S. adults have no religious affiliation. That is a 6% increase since 2016. 32% of U.S. adults seldom or never pray. That's an 18% increase since 20, uh, uh, 2007. Millennials are leading the shift away from organized religion. And, and I'm going to talk about that and why that's happening in just a little bit here. But more churches right now are closing every year than opening in the United States. In 2019, 4,500 churches closed and only 3,000 new ones started. In 2020, there were 3,850 to 7,000 churches that were going to close by the end of 2020. So that's 75 to 150 churches per week. This study that I, that I read projected that that number was going to actually double or triple in the wake of COVID. I'm going to read a quote from a friend of mine named Ed Stetzer, who's executive director of the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center. He said, church planning is slowing and the number of closures is growing. Yet the opportunity is still before us. People are searching spiritually, and the gospel is the answer. All right? Even though there's a lot more churches closing than opening, people are searching for answers more than maybe ever. 
Okay, only 65% adults in the U.S. actually now identify themselves as Christians. And you can see the stats there of how that has fluctuated over the years. In, two th- in the year 2000, uh, excuse me, 1999, it was 80, 85%. Only 47% of Americans now actually belong to a church. That was 70% in the year 2000. Now, some of you may be going, why is all of this happening? Well, there's a, a research company called Barna. You've probably heard of it. They do a lot of research, not only on church, but also culture that impacts the church and outside the church. And they, are, they report that there are some actual new trends that have, are, are having a l- huge impact on the landscape of discipleship in the church. And I want to just talk about this for a moment um, because I think it's fascinating. And I, and I, from my experience of being a pastor, this is, this is the stuff that, that, that we are dealing with. Let's talk about the state of discipleship in the U.S. First of all, I want to talk about for a moment, they, they list three things. One is the screen age. Today there's more information than ever before that is readily available that, to everyone that both augments and competes with biblical wisdom. Technology, in other words, is both friend and foe. People are armed with information now more than ever before that questions the authority of the Bible. And that is changing the game for how we as a church have to approach discipleship. We have to equip people like never before to be able to defend the faith. Then you also have the distracted era. When it comes to church engagement and personal discipleship, it's not just screens that are sucking people in. People are busier than ever with kids' sports and activities and increased workloads and recreation and leisure activities. It's become a huge deal. People are overchoiced with ways to spend their time. And, and I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that since we moved here to start Westridge in 1997, people who call themselves regular churchgoers, they are attending church fewer weekends per year and they are less involved in serving weekly or monthly in the church. Now this next trend is a big one. And it's called the shift to self. This is the rise of the individual as the center of everything. Because of original sin, people are already conditioned to have a self-absorption problem that today, uh, but, to, but, but today we, we live in what Barna calls a comparatively narcissistic era. And so whether it's consumerism or digital tools that give people instant gratification or something else. More and more people are all about me. Now let me give you some stats from Barna that I think will help you see what I'm talking about. 84% of adults in the U.S. and 66% of practicing Christians agree that the highest goal for life is to enjoy it as much as possible. 91% of adults and 76% of practicing Christians believe that the best way to find yourself is to actually look inside yourself. 97% of adults and 91% of practicing Christians agree that you need to be true to yourself. Now, here's the problem with all of that. If you claim to be a follower of Jesus and you agree with anything that I, that's on that screen right now, you are in contradiction with the man that you are claiming to follow. Because every one of those statements flies in the face of the life and the ways and the teachings of Jesus. Those statements line up perfectly with the current mindset and the teaching that, that's going on in today's culture that really it's all about you. But unfortunately, a big majority of professed Christians are being sucked into actually believing that those are biblical principles when they are not. It, and, and what it's doing, it's creating a very consumeristic, self-absorbed, narcissistic brand of Christianity. And here's what Barna says. If we peel back the layers, many Christians are using the way of Jesus as a means of pursuing the way of self. Now, how do we help people to deconvert from this religion of self to be actually becoming true disciples of Jesus? Here's what we have to do. We have to turn from self, die to self, immerse ourselves in the truth of God's word, and then put ourselves in places where God's truth is not only being taught to us, but being taught to our kids. Now, here's, here, here's how these current trends in American Christianity are playing out here at Westridge Church. The only way for us to actually really track um, how people are engaging with us on Sunday mornings in person is by looking at our kids' ministry numbers, our kids' ministry attendance numbers. We don't have any way of tracking how you come in this building, okay? Um, and, but we do know this. Kids don't drive, right? So unless they're hitchhiking 
are Ubering to church, you're bringing them. And, and we're able to track like how you're coming to church through, through basically our elementary kids ministry. So I want to just show you a couple things that I think will challenge you. And they're, they're very sobering. 91% of our elementary age kids attend less church less than two times per month. Now, unless you're doing a really good job teaching them at home, which hopefully you are, or they're you know, in a school that teaches the Bible, that means that they're only getting 24 hours of biblical teaching and community per year. 50% of our elementary kids attend less than four times per year. That means they're getting four hours of biblical teaching or community per year. 28% of our elementary age kids attend less than two times per year. That's two hours of biblical teaching community per year. Now, those numbers have not changed as a result of the challenges of the past two years. They have actually been fairly consistent over many years. And so we have some huge challenges and actually some big opportunities in front of us. And the, here's, here's the questions that we're wrestling with right now as, as a staff and our elders and everyone else. How do we get people to get past their apathy and their reluctancy to embrace fully what God has for them as followers of Jesus? How do we get help families to prioritize becoming disciples of Jesus, being fully devoted followers of Jesus? How do we get people to take responsibility for one, not, not just for themselves, but, but also to turn themselves inside out to help make disciples of other people, to, to become disciple makers? Not just taking personal responsibility for their own discipleship, but to then to live out the calling to be disciple makers. Now, I, I want to read a passage out of Philippians chapter two or three, excuse me, from the Apostle Paul that I actually I love. Apostle Paul in verse thirteen he says, "Brothers and sisters," he says, "I do not consider that I've made it my own." I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Here's what Paul is saying here. He is saying, I have not arrived yet at being a fully mature Christian. In other words, I have some work to do. But I am fully committed to pressing towards knowing Jesus more and maturing in my faith. And he says in verse 12 that I'm going to take and make every effort to take hold of that goal because Christ has taken hold of me. That's what he's saying. So he says, I'm striving forward. He says, I'm not satisfied with where I am. I want more. I want to keep growing. Paul has this holy disconsent, uh, discontent inside of him that just keeps him pressing forward. And so Paul says, here's what I'm doing. I'm leaving the past behind. And I'm straining forward to grab hold of what's ahead of me. And here's why Paul is saying this. Paul's saying, if you are going to become a fully devoted follower of Jesus and truly live out God's kingdom purpose for your life, you have to do what Tony Evans calls, you have to have a short memory and a clear purpose. That means that we have to let go of the things of yesterday that are holding us back. One of those things, just real simple, is just success. All right, there, there are a lot of things that we look at that we, you know, when, when I was in my 20s and I'm in my 30s, I, I was really involved in church. I was pouring my, serving here and there, but man, now I've gotten older in my 50s and 60s and I'm just letting the younger folks do it now. Listen, I'm gonna tell you something. I, I'm 56 and, and, and a lot of you are my age and I, I'm watching so many people who are my age or older just beginning to just kind of cash it in. And yet, here's the thing. Right now, we've got more wisdom, more maturity, more time, more resources than we've ever had. And, and, and yet, this is the time I'm challenging you to really engage and to put all of that into action, to begin to turn ourselves inside out and to really begin to give our lives away. I'm in my 50s. My wife's in, my, in her 50s. She just wrote a new book. She's hosting a big event for women in, in ministry in a couple months. Listen, Friday I, I, I preached a men's conference. Thursday I preached a revival for James Griffin, uh, uh, James Griffin up at, at Cartersville. I'm just getting warmed up here, folks. All right? For those of you that are my age or older, listen, you got more to give than you've ever given before. You've got more wisdom, more maturity, more knowledge, and we need you engaged. We need you plugged in. We need you pouring it out for all of this younger generation. 
Share in your wisdom and your knowledge. So listen, we can't let the successes of the past hold us back from moving forward. Here's what Tony Evans says. Past spiritual victories does not guarantee future uh, spiritual success. Committing ourselves to God's agenda is a day-to-day experience. Here's another thing that holds so many people back. They're past failures. God's a forgiver. God's a God of new mercies every day. God's a, a God of new beginnings. And for some of you, you need to take your past failures and you need to put them behind you and let them go. For some of you, here's another thing that's holding some of you back. Unforgiveness and bitterness. Things that have hurt you. You're bitter at people and they don't even know you're bitter at them. And all you're doing is hurting yourself. And you're missing out on all that God has for you. You're missing out on the abundant life that Jesus has for you. Because you're just, it's like you feel like you, you deserve to be upset at somebody. And, and to hold unforgiveness over them. And you don't. Matter of fact, the book of Mark says, Jesus says, if you don't forgive other people, the Father in heaven can't hear your prayer. He can't forgive you. So here, we need to let go of, un, of, of, of bitterness and hurt and anger so that we can grab hold of all that God has for us. It's, it's, it's not that you, that you don't remember the past or learn from the past, but you don't let the past be a controlling factor in your life. It means that you stop looking in the rearview mirror and you start looking out at this huge windshield that God has in front of you so that you can focus on bigger things than you have ever seen before. And Paul says here, he says, I'm not, he says, I'm, I'm over the past. And Paul had a lot of things. I mean, Paul could have really dwelt on some past mistakes and failures and some things that he did that were pretty horrific. And Paul says, I'm putting that all behind me. He says, I'm, I'm pressing on to pursue the goal of claiming the upward prize promised by God through Jesus Christ. He says, I'm not going to get bogged down by ter- uh, temporary circumstances or get trapped by earthly things or idols. He says, I'm living with an eternal kingdom perspective in mind. And that's a challenge for all of us today. So how are we as a church going to partner with you to help you and your family to leave the past behind, to get through all the craziness that we've been through, to begin to look forward to all that God has for you to become fully devoted followers of Jesus. How are we going to do it? First of all, I want to just put the word prayer up on the screen right here. You've heard me use this term drawn near a lot over the past few weeks. My wife actually got me a bracelet. You can't read it, but it says draw near. Just to remind her, she wears one too, that that's what our heart's focus is for this year. You've heard me use the term revival quite a bit over the past few months. What's a revival? What is it? Well, here's what William Sprague says about it. He wrote this book back in the 1800s. Revivals occur mainly through the ordinary instituted means of grace. Preaching, pastoring, worshiping, and prayer. Just simple things bring revival. Tim Keller, pastor in New York, says, There are three parts to spiritual revival. When nominal Christians are converted into true disciples of Jesus. When lukewarm Christians experience God's love and presence more directly causing them to genuinely repent of idols. They will, uh, and then they will be more readily reach out to their communities in love. And then non-believers outside of the church are drawn to the church in remarkable numbers. That's when revival takes place. When we start seeing nominal Christians start becoming truly devoted followers of Jesus and lukewarm Christians all of a sudden experiencing God's love and they all of a sudden it begins to impact and shape the community and when non-believers start walking in this building because they know that things are happening that they can't, quite understand, but they're drawn to this place, we will then know that revival is taking place at Westridge Church. And then Keller says there are three instrumental means that the Holy Spirit tends to use of, of revival. He says recovery of the gospel of grace, creativity, and corporate prayer. Now I said a moment ago, I'm 56, in August I'll be 57, Westridge will be 25 years old in September, we're going to celebrate that big this year. I cannot give you the exact time and date when I will pass this church off to a younger guy. But there are a few things that I am desperate to see here. I long to see before I do. I want to see revival take place in this community, and I want to leave this church with a reputation of being a house of prayer. We just, today's the last day of our 21 days of prayer. We've had 1,560 people engaged in it. And I, and I want to say, to Dakota Adair and Steve Deal, and I know Blake Odgers had a part in this, and my brother Kevin and Jessica Dixon. What a great job all of you did of creating that content. That was phenomenal. But tomorrow night, tomorrow night is our night of prayer. Um, it's our first one of this year. Every, the first Monday night, the first Monday of every month, we're going to be having a night of prayer. 
And here's one of the ways that I'm going to judge if we are being successful as a church as we go to the future. The power of that prayer meeting. The power of that prayer meeting. Um, Jerry Falls Sr., who died in 2007, the founder of Liberty University, it's where I, Amy and I went, he said this all the time. He says, nothing of eternal significance ever happens apart from prayer. I believe that with all my heart. Here's what, what old school pastor Samuel Chadwick says. He says, Satan dreads nothing but prayer. His one concern is to keep the saints from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil. He marks at our wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. That's powerful. Here's another word, uh, two words I want to put on the screen. Discipleship pathways. I said earlier, the past few years have been challenging, not just for me, but for every pastor that I know. Regardless of church size, background, skin color, education, it's been tough, okay? The church in America right now is more divided than any time in my lifetime. And some of you have probably lost some friendships over the past few years because of some of the issues that have divided us. There's an re- article that recently came out in the New York Times by a guy named, named David Brooks that discusses the current state of the evangelical church and the division that's taken place. The article, and it's fascinating, you should read it. It's called The Dissenters Trying to Save Evangelical, uh, e- Evangelicalism from Itself. And he said in this article, he says, there are three issues that are dividing Christians. And, and I agree with this article, by the way. He says one of them is politics. He goes into detail on that. Another one is sex abuse scandals in the evangelical churches and parachurch organizations, all the cover-up, and then attitudes about race relationships. And I would add the church's response to COVID, okay, which has been all over the country. But he also talks quite a bit how these three issues and how the response of evangelicals are causing people to leave the church, especially millennials. They're, They're not leaving the faith, but many of them are leaving the church, I was at a conference a couple months ago, and a, and a pastor, Australian pastor by the name of John Tyson, who pastors in New York City, who has become an expert on American culture. He said that recently over, that, 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 that over a million young adults, 18 to 29, are leaving the church every year. Every year, a million millennials, young adults, are leaving the church every year. I've had several conversations over the past, just even few weeks, one that just the other night, with parents who have young adults who've left the church, and even the faith over the big C church's response or lack of response to the issues that I just mentioned. And on the other hand of that, the other side of that, I have been knee-deep in conversations more than ever over the past few years with people who have shared very strong opinions with me surrounding issues like politics and race and justice and the church's response to COVID. And I'm telling you, I'm sitting there listening, and it's been heartbreaking to me. Because where they've landed is completely contrary to the ways and the life and the teaching of Jesus. And so God has used all of these conversations to cause me and, and, and our pastor director team here at Westridge to ask some hard questions about how have we been doing around this whole issue of making disciples. The past two years for us have been a season of reevaluating and rethinking. We are totally aware all the time that we are competing with a culture that is constantly feeding people information that is contrary to scriptural principles. And it's going on 24-7. I mean, it's just in people's ears all the time. They're swimming in it. But we've been taking a deep, honest look at how we've been doing over the past 25 years at making disciples. And it's, I'm telling you, it's been hard. Some of these conversations I've left just scratching my head. But it's been a good thing. It's been a good thing. God has done some really good things over the past 25 years. And in September, we're going to celebrate that big. But here's what we know. We have to do better. we got to do a better job. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. So I just want you to know, over the last several months, our adult group staff, our family ministry staff have been working hard to come up with a new, clear discipleship pathway that's going to put some great tools and opportunities at your disposal like you've never had before. I mean, if our mission statement as a church is this, that we are leading people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ, and the marks of a fully devoted follower of Jesus is someone who loves God and loves others, grows in their faith, serves others, and shares Jesus, then we have to do a better job at providing you with the resources and tools to make sure that you and your family have every opportunity 
to mature as followers of Jesus and, and to understand the purpose that God's created you for. We want to see your family thrive, to thrive spiritually. And so we're going to do everything we can to equip you to thrive in your relationship with Jesus. But here's the, here's the thing. You have to do your part. You have to own it. You have to begin to own it for yourselves and your family. Here's what we all have to remember. Full devotion to Christ is normal for a believer. We are called, every one of us, we're called to be fully devoted disciples. Jesus does not call us to follow him with half of our hearts. Jesus doesn't call us to dip our toes into the waters of Christianity. When Jesus was calling people, when he was here on earth, when he was calling people to follow him, to be a disciple, it was an all-in call. It was a radical call to leave the past behind and to follow him on a new path, a new way of life, the way of Jesus. And part of that call is to not just be a disciple, but to be a disciple maker. You cannot be a fully devoted follower of Jesus without following his command to make disciples of other people. Here's what Jesus said before he ascended up into heaven, Matthew 28. He said, if therefore go and make disciples. That's not the church. Like, that's, that wasn't written to a church. That was written to every one of us. Therefore go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. We're, we're going to roll out some new opportunities in the upcoming months that I'm really excited about. But I, I want to challenge you today. To recommit yourself, not only to prayer, but to becoming disciples who make disciples. Now, I want to talk about a couple more things, and I'm going to fly through this if, if you don't mind, so put on your seatbelts. I want to talk about our special needs building and athletic facilities. I'm going to give you a couple stats. Nearly 50% of special needs families have left at least one church because their child was not included or welcome. 56% of special needs parents have kept their child from religious activity because there was no support for that family, for that child. 86%, 86.5% of church attending special needs families need more education and training uh, about disability. That's from Linda Jones Alt. She wrote this as, as a doctoral dissertation. In May, we're going to break ground on a new 10,000 square foot addition to our building, specifically designed for people with special needs. I want to show you a picture of what it's going to look like. Okay. The whole back of this building over on, where I'm pointing to between us and Walmart is going to be, the, the parking lot's going to be, the, the parkway's going to become a mess for a little while. You're not going to be able to come in that back door. There's going to be a drop-off circle. That whole part over there into that empty grass area is going to become that building right there, which I'm so excited about. Now, in addition to this, we're going to clear off a bunch of our property between here, us and Walmart, to create some green space and some fields for our children and students. We're going to have some athletic fields up there, some green space. But here's the challenge. We, we were prepared to be able to do all of this going into COVID without going into debt. But the price of steel in the last two years has gone up tremendously. And so here's my challenge to you. My challenge to you is if you can help us by jumping into the vision fund, okay, $35 above and beyond your regular giving, your regular offerings, your regular tithes. We can go into this building without taking out a line of credit or, going, or taking out a loan. Okay, 3,500 families could jump in and just go, hey, we're, above our tithes, above our offerings, we're going to give $35 a month. There's the go to westerns.com slash vision fund, and you can do that. And if you'll do that, we can do this. We, we have done incredible things already through this vision fund, but I want to relaunch it this morning so that we can start building this addition in the strongest financial position possible. We're going to build it in May, Lord willing. Okay? But I want to do it without going into further debt. The special needs community is one of the most unchurched communities in our country. I want them to know that there's a place for them and that we care about them because Jesus cares about them. Then I'm going to talk about reaching the lost and the unchurched. There are 357,000 people that live within a 10-mile radius of here, about a 20-minute drive time. 85% of those people do not go to church. Now, here's what I want to challenge you to do right now. Right now, today. Ask God to put someone on your heart that is far from God. They're either not a Christ follower or maybe they've 
they've drifted in their faith walk. And ask God to put them on your heart right now and commit to pray for them every single day for that person to become your one. Your one. Well, what if I want to have three? Have three, but I'm asking you to do one, okay? And ask God to give you a divine moment for you to be able to share your faith story with them. And then here's a challenge. I want to, add just, I want to encourage you from here to there to invite them to Easter on April 17th. We're going to have a good Friday service and then six other services available. We're going to share the gospel. We're going to lay it. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Folks, it's called a layup. I mean, it's like throwing a big beach ball up and you can hit it, right? Everybody gets a swing and they can hit it. I mean, in, statistics say that 85% of people will come with you to an Easter service if you'll just invite them. So listen, I, I want to, I, as a church, I, I want to recommit ourselves to owning the lostness of this community. You can't make disciples apart from evangelism. Discipleship begins the moment that someone places their faith and trust in Jesus Christ to be their personal Savior. Every single week, as I'm praying around this building on Sunday mornings, I'm out here with my, my dog Gibson, and we're praying. I'm asking God, Lord, would you just give me one person that will put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ to be their Savior? Amy's like, pray for more. I'm like, I just want, just, Lord, give me one person every single week that will put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. Last week, we had six. God bless my prayers. But listen, there are, there are brand new, every week there's somebody who puts their, that responds to the, the end of this service to put their faith and trust in Christ. They become new followers of Jesus. Listen, there are brand new neighborhoods and, that have popped up all over this church in the last few years. People in Paulding and West Cobb and so many new people who are moving in from all over the country into this area. Let's invest in them and invite them to church. Let, let's recommit ourselves this morning to owning the lostness of this community. Let's fill this building back up again with people who have never heard the gospel so that they can have the same chance that you've had, that I had, to receive forgiveness and purpose and new life found only in Jesus. And then let's commit ourselves together to living sent. Jesus, when he came here, he had a mission. He walked into a church, into a synagogue. He took a scroll opened up the book of Isaiah, and here's what he said. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favor of the Lord's favor, the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus laid it out. He rolled the scroll back up, put it in the holder, dropped the mic and walked out. But before he did, I mean, he, he, this was a man that lived with purpose. He lived with meaning. He lived his life on mission. He lived being sent. And I want to encourage you to live sent. Turn your life inside out and say, Lord, I'm going to live sent. I want to give you a couple opportunities we've got coming up. We've got a men's trip to Alaska, July the 9th through the 16th. You can talk to Tyler Newsom about that. He'll give you details. We've got a, a Kentucky rebuild trip for Towns that have been devastated by the tornadoes in the past several months. We, we've got a Scotland trip coming up in September. We've got a Guatemala trip coming up in October 22 through 29. I know we've got a lot of our young adults who are sitting right down in front of me right now. We're going to be opening up something called Jensen Boston. We're giving our young adults the opportunity this upcoming year, 18 to 25, to go to Boston to, to work alongside of our church planners for eight weeks. And to just assist them to see if they've been called into in ministry. Listen, as you know, we've been a church that's invested in helping other churches to be planted since 1999. I asked Kevin Dunlap this morning, how many churches have we planted or have helped plant since that year? He said 197 all over the United States. Hundreds more all over the world. And over the years, as you know, if you've been here for a while, we've sent out staff members. We've also sent out hundreds of people to be part of New church plants, Cartersville, up to Canton, Orlando, Baltimore, Boston. I mean, we have invested thousands and thousands of dollars into new churches. You say, why? Well, C. Peter Wagner says, the single most effective evangel evangelistic methodology under heaven is new churches. I want to just show you a couple families that I'm super proud of that we're getting ready to launch out. Dakota and Maggie Adair and their new little boy that they just adopted, Elijah. They, they just got back from... Central Texas. God's moving in their heart. Dakota's been one of our church planning residents along with, with uh, Blake Odgers who was up on stage a moment ago. 
but we're getting ready to send them out to plant a brand new church. I don't know if you recognize this family, um, but um, I've known them since the two in the middle, since they were 15 and 14. And their youngest son is named after my dad. We're sending them out to Edinburgh, Scotland to plant a brand new church called Take Hold Church. And uh, I'm so excited. They're prayer walking Edinburgh right now as we speak. And then some of you may not know this couple, this family. This is Jonathan and Rebecca Lindsay. This was my, my son's woodwork shop teacher in, at North Paulding High School. They started coming to Westridge and went on a missions trip to Scotland a few years ago. And God just broke their heart for the lostness of that nation. And now they've literally sold everything and are moving to Scotland with their family to open up um, a lodging facility to host our teams, to host other churches, to host business trips over there, to host all with the opportunity and, and goal in mind of sharing the gospel with people. But here's what I want, I want to tell you. you. You don't have to move to Scotland or to plant a church to, be, to live sent. You can live sent and live out the mission of Jesus in your own neighborhood. You can live out the mission of Jesus where your kids play ball or where they go to school or where, where they work. I, I, I want to... I want to share a story as we end that, that I just think beautifully defines living sin. And, I, and it also helps us as a, as a church this morning to, to honor Black History Month. There was a man uh, whose name was George Liley. He was born in eight, 1752. It's his picture right there. Lived most of his life as a slave. But in 1773, George became a follower of Jesus. And he was baptized by a Baptist minister. And he was eventually freed by his master, Henry Sharp, in 1775 and was later then ordained to be uh, a pastor. He spent his life, after f- coming to Christ, sharing his faith in slave quarters and, and on plantations throughout Savannah and parts of South Carolina. And on several occasions, people would try to enslave him, but, they, but they, God would step in miraculously and, and rescue him. But several of the men that Liley led to Christ then began to plant churches in South Carolina. One of these guys actually went on to Nova Scotia, just escaping, trying to escape slavery again, and then began to plant churches all over Nova Scotia, Canada. Another one of Liley's disciples, Andrew Bryan, planted this church right here in Savannah that still stands to this day. It's the first African Baptist church of Savannah. And this man, Andrew Bryan, even though he was beaten, the, the church was... They tried to burn this place down several times. He, I mean, he faced all kinds of persecution from local residents. Brian faithfully preached in this church for many, many years, and it grew to a membership of 389 people, making it one of the 10 largest Baptist churches in America at the time. And while that was happening, Liley, George Liley and his family, had to, they had to escape the United States. They went to the Kingston, Jamaica, where he then built another church despite tons of persecution there. And in 1791, here's what he wrote. He, wrote, he penned these words. Lyle said, this, I baptized 400 in Jamaica. We have nigh 350 members, a few white people among them. And then Lyle eventually opened up a free school for slaves and free children in Jamaica that uh, was run by his deacons. This is, this is what this man did. George Lyle took his one and only life as hard as it was, and he lived sent regardless of what this man faced or where he had, had, had to move to to escape being re, re-enslaved or persecuted, the man just kept on going. He lived his one and only life as a fully devoted follower of Jesus. Listen, Westridge, as we move into the future together, let's refocus ourselves to be men and women who are committed to prayer, who, are, who long to see revival take place in our lives and in, in our community. We, we have been through some tough things over the last couple of years, but I want to tell you something, nothing compared to what that man went through. And yet he just kept grinding. Lived his last breath serving Jesus. That's how I want to go out of here. Not this church. That's how I want to go out of life. I want to live my, I want to, I want to live my life breathing my last breath serving Jesus whether it's 80 years, 90 years, whatever. I, whatever God gives me, I want my last breath to be served living for Jesus. So we've got to recommit ourselves, not just to prayer, but to living and following the ways and the teaching of Jesus. Let's, let's be fully devoted followers that, that even if it means that we've got to swim against the culture, even if it means we have to lose a, a few friendships along the way. 
Let's be disciples who live out the commands of Jesus to make other disciples. Let's stay engaged and connected to the church. Let's invest in what God wants to do through his local church with our spiritual gifts, through our service, through our finances. Let's commit ourselves once again to being that church that has a heartbeat for lost people, the unchurched. Let's care again. The people are dying and going to hell every day. Let's live lives like George Lightley on a mission for Jesus. Regardless of what we face, we live our lives with purpose and meaning. We live our lives sent. And here's what you need to know. I know some of you are going through a lot. It's possible. Some of you have been through a lot. It's possible. Here's how I know. We serve a God who says, I'm able. Ephesians 3.20 Three twenty twenty one. This is my, Amy and I are grabbing hold of these two verses as the verses that we want to finish our lives with, our ministry careers with and about our lives with. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine according to his power. What? That is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let's do this. God's given us a big vision. There's so much yet to do. We're just getting warmed up. Let's give our all to the all in all. Let's be all in. I want you to ask you to bow your head for just a moment. If you're here today, maybe you are somebody's one. They've been praying for you for a long time. Maybe they invited you to church not knowing you were going to hear a vision Sunday. But God's just stirred in your heart and you're like, you know what? I'm not passing up this opportunity to give my life to Jesus. I want to to ask you to pray with me right now. If you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus and asked for forgiveness of sin and made Jesus Christ the Savior of your life, pray with me at this moment. Say, Lord, at this very moment, I put all my faith and my trust in you alone. I come with you, before you with a humble heart, asking for forgiveness of sin. Jesus, you are the savior of my life. And I put all my faith and my trust in you alone right now. What you did for me on the cross was enough. Jesus, you're the son of God, the savior of the world. I give my life to you at this moment. If you just prayed that with me, we're going to give you an opportunity to let us know you made that decision in just a moment. the rest of you, I just want to ask you to stand with me for a moment. We're going to sing. I, I, I believe that when we hear God's word, the natural response is for us to worship. And I want to ask you not to leave because this is so important. I want us to turn our hearts towards heaven right now. And I want us just as in adoration and in worship and in love and thankfulness to say, Lord, thank you for all that you've done, for getting us to this place, for getting me through all the things I've been through the last few years. But Lord, I want my life to matter moving forward like never before. I want to be a a person, a prayer. I want to be a disciple, a disciple maker. I want to be connected. I want to have a heart for lost people. I want to live my life sent like George Liley. But Lord, right now, I just want to worship you and thank you. I want to give my heart, my, my, my voice, I want to sing to the King of Kings, the, 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 the God, the Father, Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Katie's going to lead us. I want you just to just sing with all your heart. You're like, I can't really sing. Who cares? All right? We, we, it's so loud in here. Nobody can sing you any, hear you sing anyways, right? If you want to come and pray, recommit yourself to the Lord. These steps are open right now. Father, we just want you to move in our hearts, move in our church, move in our spirit. Lord, would you just move in this place right now in a powerful way? In Jesus' name we pray.
Till that stone was moved for good For the lamb had conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was born Then the Spirit lit the flame Now this gospel truth room and I mean you're hearing our pastor talk about this vision that God has for our church for our family as we look in the days ahead and but maybe you're sitting here and you've never even taken your first step you've never responded to Jesus you've never taken your first step in following him and we just want to give you an opportunity to do that you can simply text the word follow to 770-222-2125 there's nothing magical about this text message what it does is it It helps us as a team connect with you so that once again, we can help you take your initial step to following Jesus. And it gets you on that ramp to look at, man, the vision and the purpose that God has, not just for our church, not just for this family, but for you, for you and for your life. We wanna help you take your first step. Maybe you're here and you you are a follower of Jesus, you're in a relationship with Jesus, but man, our pastor talking about, and maybe you've just been sitting on the sideline for just a little too long. You're ready to get back in the game. You're ready to take that step. You're ready to get back in, whether it's a group, right? Whether it's serving on a team, whatever it may be, you're just ready to get in the game. And we wanna invite you to text the word connect to 770-222-2125. And once again, that helps us help you take your next step in the life of our church. You heard a lot of, of dream and vision, believe in God for bigger and better things in the future. And so lastly, we wanna invite you to partner with us through giving. Once again, we wanna see God continue to do bigger and better things in the future. As you just heard, he's done great things in the past, but we have no intention of slowing down. And so continue to partner with us, continue to not only give, not only provide your resources, but your time, your energy, your effort as we continue seeking those in our community to lead, to become fully devoted followers of Jesus. Well, church, You're so, so, so loved. Can we thank our pastor and our team once again for leading out so well this morning? Hope you have a great weekend and a great week. You're loved.